funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. A diesel-powered engine on a farm works hard and operates in a grueling environment. Soy biodiesel fuels stand up to the challenge of powering farm equipment, but are also renewable and environmentally responsible as well. The Nebraska Soybean Board is committed to encouraging the use of soy biodiesel to protect the environment and sustain Nebraska's agriculture. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Mobile phone and tablet usage is on the rise, and Market Journal is ready to provide these users with the latest agricultural information. The Market Journal mobile app is now available for iPads and smartphones, such as iPhones and Android devices. By using the app, users will have the option to view current and archive program segments with the touch of a finger. Two major shipping ports for goods moving to China, Japan. The end of day futures time. prices are available each day to help crop and livestock producers with their marketing plans. Users can even select their local grain elevators in the state to identify current prices. Underneath the news tab, several up to the minute ag stories are available from Market Journal, the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, and UNL's Crop Watch. The mobile app will identify the location of users' devices using GPS technologies to provide local weather conditions. Within the mobile app, users can learn more about the Market Journal show and learn about the program team and regular guests. The iPhone and Android versions of the app allow users to submit their agricultural photos and ask questions of the program's experts, which may be addressed on future programs. For Apple devices such as iPhones and iPads, the free app is available through iTunes. The Market Journal mobile app is also available through the Google Play mobile app store for Android devices. Market Journal, television for making agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. Heavy rain fell across Nebraska last week, spreading some relief over dry areas of the state. Paul Yasa will join us later in the show to talk about erosion problems resulting from three to four inches of rain here in southeastern Nebraska. Also on the show, Bruce Anderson will outline options for alfalfa affected by cold temperatures and hail. And Jeff Bradshaw describes how dry weather in western Nebraska may be conducive to increased grasshopper damage. Lisa Luntz from the Nebraska Soybean Board will talk with us about ag literacy and Elaine Cub from the ARC Group is our marketing analyst. But first, lawmakers in Washington were more than talkative this week about the potential for a 2012 farm bill. Senate committee members told North American agricultural journalists they've scheduled next week to begin the markup session. While the Senate is pushing a $23 billion cut over 10 years, the House Ag Committee passed a measure on Wednesday to cut $33.2 billion over 10 years. That committee said it arrived on the number by making common sense reforms in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Colin Peterson, the top-ranking Democrat of the House Ag Committee, says the process is a waste of time and the real work starts when debate begins. The current farm bill expires September 30th. Next week, we'll talk with UNL Extension Public Policy Specialist Brad Lubin about the direction of those talks. After a small fire delayed USDA Crops Progress report on Monday, the agency released numbers on Tuesday showing 17 percent of corn had been planted across the country. Farmers in Nebraska have planted 4 percent of their corn on the way to what the USDA says will be a national total of 95.9 million acres. When we talked with Elaine Cub last month, she thought the expected numbers were too high. So we started by asking where all the acres came from. Well, they came from 
everywhere. That, that was, was what was most surprising to me looking at that planting report was that of the 26 crops that they list on that report, mm -hmm. only six of them lost acres at all. Soybeans was one of them, and that's the really big surprise is that you would have fewer soybeans in this year of all years right. when you have really good opportunities to sell soybeans forward. And then a bunch of, you know, like peanuts and things like that, literally peanuts. So, so really, the acres didn't come out of any of the major production categories, which means that we truly found, quote unquote, more right. ground, that they did make more of it, which you did see as you were driving around the countryside this past winter. You saw people bringing out, you know, river bottom ground or prevent plant acres from last year or some pasture or CRP that had not been in production for the past few years. So maybe the question now is how, how much does that stay? Does it stay right at 95.9 or are farmers going to say, you know what, I'm getting in on the other side? Well, the corn acres is probably up to, whether it is corn or beans is probably up to some sway at this point. But are we going to plant that total number of acres? I would say mm -hmm. almost certainly yes, because we've had really good planting opportunities right. all spring. It's been early, they've been going at it very fast. They're going to be able to plant as much corn as they want to plant. And whether or not they switch some of it to soybeans, I think, I think we're about to find out. You wrote on DTN this week about a uh, about the strong basis levels we're seeing. Last time we talked, you thought we could see record basis, but the, the question is, how long does it hold out? How far does it go? Yeah, well, I did a little looking, and last year, so we are higher now, or stronger. We have mm -hmm. stronger basis levels now than we saw last year at this time by quite a bit. But I would say there's maybe only about 20 cents more of push in the basis level before you start running up against the record high of what we ever even mm -hmm. saw even last summer, last July, very early August before the harvest started to come on. Um, basis levels here in Nebraska at the ethanol plants were about 40 over the September at that point, mm -hmm. which was crazy. And and if we to get to that point again now, to get to 40 over the July, we'd have to have, like I said, another 20 cents. So that's your historical ceiling, but it, in this situation, these are untested waters, really. There's, n there's nothing to say yeah. that that's, that's the hard <laughs> and fast. You can't get over that level. Well, today as we talk, it's the end of Wednesday. The markets have closed, and they took it on the chin, both in uh, beans and corn. Yeah. But beans over the past month have held out at least better than, than corn has. Um, the question there, does it continue? Well, I think what you saw today, um, particularly in beans, was some fund selling, people mm -hmm. wanting to take off. They have record long exposure. They want to take some of that off right. of, their, of their books. And you certainly saw all the hallmarks or the earmarks of, of, of spread trading unwinding in the corn market because it was the nearby, the old crop corn contracts that really got hit today, whereas the new crop contracts have really held, had in, held together quite well mm -hmm. and stayed above their recent lows so far. So that's what you see now, but going forward, are you going to see more and more of that as the charts have this damage and as technically these, these markets are not as supportive to fund buying or speculative buying? Maybe, but I think that the markets don't necessarily need the speculators to be in there at this point to maintain these prices. I think commercial buyers will, are willing to pay these prices, which we see in the basis. We see people willing to pay these high prices for grain and make it work in an economic sense. But can't you also say that speculators are gonna have more of an effect I mean, aren't they going to go more at it and shift it more than, than a commercial might? Um, in some circumstances, yes. But if you look at the actual participation of the proportion of the markets that are made up of mm -hmm. commercial buyers versus speculative buyers, speculators are less than a quarter of the total market. Yeah, I guess my question was speculators are coming in and out quicker yeah. than commercials are. So would it would it move faster? Certainly, you can get these pullbacks like this, like, yeah. like we yeah. saw this week. I think those can certainly happen, and I think we were sort of due for that. But whether that is a long-term damage to these price levels, I don't necessarily think so at this point. One thing that hasn't been propping up corn as much as it had perhaps last year is ethanol. We're at high levels of stocks, but do you think the industry is in trouble? I think the industry has trimmed back their production to the levels that they are comfortable with. They may not be making the profits that we have seen in, mm -hmm. in the past, but they are sticking with it at this point. And if we can ever work through that inventory, perhaps in the summer driving season, if we can start you know, just working through some of that inventory, there's a wide spread between the prices of ethanol and the prices of gasoline. So there's certainly room there for ethanol to come up and, and become more profitable. Quickly on corn and beans, if you haven't forward contracted yet, time to get on the boat? Well, I think so. I think the time, this is certainly a, a time of year when you would like mm -hmm. to have a certain portion of your crop sold, particularly if you know that it's in the ground and it's gotten a good start and that you're pretty confident about growing the crop. Um, but I ha have, myself, I'm waiting for some better opportunities going forward before I start adding to that, to that short position. Next week, we'll take another look at corn and soybean markets with John Moret from J.E. Moret Grain Company in Brunswick. In our recent interview with Nebraska Department of Ag Director Greg Ibaugh, you heard how free trade agreement implementation in South Korea would increase export possibilities from Nebraska and the U.S. Along with South Korea, Colombia and Panama signed FTAs with the U.S. last October. 
We learned this week that implementation of Columbia's FTA would begin on May 15th. Some tariffs will be eliminated immediately, such as those on soybeans, soy meal, and soy flour. In 2010, the United States exported $832 million of agricultural products to Columbia. In late January, we reported on soil moisture concerns throughout Nebraska. While those concerns continue, recent rains have given some relief to portions of the state. If there's a complaint to be had, perhaps it's the speed at which rain fell. We talked with UNL Extension engineer Paul Yassa on Tuesday about how water eroded portions of some farmland. Well, uh, this past weekend we had about uh, two and a half, three, maybe up to three and a half inches of rain blow through this area. And the rain came, uh, some came gentle, a lot came fast. And that fast raindrop impact hit an unprotected soil surface and we can detach from soil particles. Well, if we got unprotected soil, we get a situation like we have here where the water started to run. It definitely had some erosion problems. So what do we learn in a storm like this when the rain comes so fast and it was so dry? What do we learn about how to go forward and maybe plan for the next season? Well, the main thing is just try to get that soil surface protected. It's that raindrop impact on the soil surface. It detaches the soil particles. As it does that, we form a crust in the soil surface so less water can soak in. The less soaks in, we get more runoff. Those detached soil particles get carried away. So the key is let's get that soil surface protected. And how do you do that? Well, I'm a fan of no-till, leaving crop residue from last year's crop out there. Another thing that's really popular in the ag magazines now is cover crops. Get something growing there just to get that soil surface protected. Our cash crop takes over for that later in the season, but that's not growing here in an April type of thunderstorm. Well, when you talk about cover crops, is that not only an area you can plant across the entire field, but also parts of fields? How did that work in a storm like this? On a storm like this, uh, we have a nice example in this field uh, across the hill here where they did the dirt work here, rebuilding terraces, doing some tillage, but they planted the oats cover crop there, and it actually anchored some of the soil. The rain still came fast and some uh, ran off. But a good established cover crop, the good root system, helps anchor the soil and that crop residue above the ground, the growing cover crop, absorbs that raindrop impact. Break down the erosion and how it works from the process of the rain hitting the ground and, and the different types that you've seen in fields from the storm. Well, with wind erosion and water erosion, it's got the same three steps. The first is soil particle detachment. When an unprotected soil gets struck by the force of wind, or in this case, the force of rain, detached soil particle, then we get transport. Either the wind moves it, or in this case, the flowing water moves it. And the third step is deposition. Slow the wind down, slow the water down, it settles out. And so I have that uh, detachment, transport, deposition. Here the detached soil particles from the top of the hill got transported down the hill and settled out down here on the bottom, covered up some of this crop. Is there a time when the rain's just gonna be so heavy that nothing's gonna stop it? Well, it's quite true. Uh, we can uh, spend money to make uh, a terrace system next to bulletproof. A farmer who can't afford that, and uh, we as society don't wanna help cost share that. So a lot of our ag structures are built what we call a 10-year design storm. Uh, the type of the rainstorm that comes once in every 10 years, we're going to have a failure, we're going to have to fix it. Uh, the bad news is uh, these terraces were repaired and rebuilt, and uh, before even were used, he got the one in 10 year storm, so he had a problem. And so what's the key there? If you're rebuilding a terrace, even now, before planting, which most people have probably done, but if you have to rebuild? The key thing is just get it protected as soon as you can. Uh, when they're doing uh, highway road cuts, uh, roadsides, we see them put a straw mulch out there. We can't afford to do that on a field size basis, but we can go out there with a, a cover crop seed, get something seeded there early. This dirt work was done soon enough, we could have planted something a month ago, two months ago, had something growing there to protect that soil surface. What's the concern going forward? If fields have already washed away, is there another concern that if, if another hard rain comes, the pathways are already there? Pathways are already there, and uh, the farmers sure don't like those when they go bouncing across them with their sprayers. <laughs> it's a little rough out there. Uh, the key thing is we, if we fill them in, we have to anchor the soil, get something growing there. And so a lot of times I'll tell a farmer in a field like this, like see what comes up, then get the areas fixed that need fixing, to leave the rest of the field. So you're saying don't necessarily replant quite yet? That's right. It's still early enough. We're here in April. Uh, this field we can decide another three weeks if we need to replant still get crop in on time. And you can still make a decent crop off of it, you think? That's true. When it comes to dry production in southeast Nebraska, if I can plant by mid-May, uh, I'm still doing pretty good. Rain wasn't the only weather concern this week. Cold temperatures and hail have taken a toll on some alfalfa. UNL Extension Forage Specialist Bruce Anderson explains the options to optimize yield. Well, I think the thing we've really got to do is determine how much damage there actually was from either one of them. Uh, with the frost and the freeze, uh, I don't think we've really had too many situations where there's been significant enough freeze damage to warrant cutting early. 
Uh, we've had plenty of time now to, to see what the effect is so we can make that judgment pretty readily if we haven't done so already. But uh, if it's just been the tops of the plants that have been hurt either by hail or by frost, uh, uh, just let the plants recover on their own. It, it's hardly worth uh, the time and expense of going out and making a, an extra early harvest uh, just to try and rectify that problem. But if uh, damage has gone down into uh, the canopy and some of the hailed fields may really have had some uh, very significant uh, damage out on them uh, where maybe the top half of the canopy or more has been damaged, then doing some harvest at that point, especially if there's enough there yet to harvest, uh, can be readily justified because it will speed up the recovery of that alfalfa. Bruce says because alfalfa was in good shape before cold or hail, it should recover fairly quickly. And now to the western half of the state, where moisture has been sparse at best. In the Panhandle, rain this week totaled half an inch at the most and three hundredths at the least. Jeff Bradshaw, UNL Extension Entomologist in Scotts Bluff, says those dry conditions lead to an increased potential for grasshoppers to be worse than usual. Because of the dry weather and because we still do have a uh, pretty good risk forecasted by the USDA for grasshopper outbreaks, uh, that we are uh, concerned with our grasshopper numbers this year. So Jeff, how serious is that number then put out by the USDA? A uh, pretty severe number. In parts, they'll be lower, uh, but in particular places like Garden County, for example, uh, Sheridan County that had high numbers last year uh, can maybe expect to have those, uh, those severe infestations continue. Jeff, how is this year different? How does the dryness affect what grasshoppers are able to do as we go through spring and into summer? Yeah, well, the issue with the dry weather is that, um, you know, it doesn't help us with uh, grass growth whatsoever. And so there increases the chance uh, with that that grasshoppers, that fewer grasshoppers can have a, a greater impact on, on drier rangeland. So, Jeff, for rangeland producers in the state, what's the, what's the recommendation then if they're worried about the risk? Uh, the key thing for grasshopper control, uh, control of any insect, is to scout. And so get out on your range, uh, check and see what your grasshopper situation is. And uh, we've got some thresholds and some protocols online uh, that you can use uh, for scouting for grasshoppers. And what we're looking for is to control nymph or immature grasshopper populations. And we have some thresholds uh, that generally around 15 to 20 grasshoppers per square yard uh, that can be used uh, in determining if you've got an economic number of uh, immature grasshoppers on your rangeland. So if you meet a required threshold, what's the recommended treatment? Uh, there's a number of chemical compounds that can be used. Uh, one common uh, program that's used is called the RATS program. Uh, reduced area agent treatments and what that allows you to do or what it calls for is spraying swaths of land uh, but then leaving uh, untreated swaths so basically those untreated swaths can serve as um, uh, a refuge for beneficials uh, that can move into the treated swaths uh, once those compounds uh, uh, wear off and so typically what is used uh, is a compound called demolin uh, mixed with uh, crop oil as well as canola uh, to attract actually the grasshoppers in. Uh, and then that compound um, is a growth regulator that keeps those grasshoppers from molting from nymph to adult. As Jeff mentioned, more information on scouting for and controlling grasshoppers can be found in a series of NEB guides on the CropWatch website. Sugar normally doesn't come to mind when you think about crop inputs. But in the April Nebraska Farmer, you'll read about two Nebraska farmers who tried to sweeten their corn last year. Scott Gonnerman of Gresham and brothers Dennis and Rod Valentine of Fairfield applied sugar to some of their corn in 2011 because they had heard it might increase yields. Neither farm found a yield advantage, but they both cited a slight improvement in standability in the sugar-treated strips. UNL specialists say there is little research on the use of sugar in corn or soybeans. But you can read more about this unusual treatment in the April Nebraska Farmer. At the recent Nebraska Soybean Board meeting here in Lincoln, we sat down with District 2 Director Lisa Luntz. Lisa is also the, on the Board of Directors for the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. We started by asking what producers in agriculture are doing well when it comes to communicating with consumers about where their food comes from. That's an ongoing process. And in the past, agriculture has tend to, tended to not share with the consumer 
you know, information about where they, their food comes from. And we're pretty science-based, and so as producers, we make decisions on science. Well, the consumer doesn't use that information to make their decision. They like to go to the grocery store and have lots of choices. And I think it's very important that the consumer has those choices when they go to the store. But then on the other side of that, we need to have conversations with consumers about where their food is coming from, how it is produced, why we produce it the way we do, and um, help that education progress pro process. And the Farmers and Ranchers Alliance was started to try to start those food dialogues, is what I call them. And they have now about sev over 70 um, agriculture organizations, some industries that have come together and policy is not discussed, the controversial things are not discussed, but they're just talking about you know, why we do the things we do and about how food is produced. So at these food dialogues or with these food dialogues, is it a kind of a back and forth or the concerns are discussed as well? Yes, they are. And last September, they had four, di four dialogues on the same day across the nation. And they had anyone from chefs to you know, people that don't agree with conventional you know, food production. And, had, and then they had the largest dairy in Indiana represented. And, and um, it started some things. And there's a website out there, fooddialogues.com, that kind of continues these um, conversations because consumers do have a lot of questions about where their food comes from and there's a lot of people out there giving misinformation or you know information that maybe I don't necessarily agree with and we would like the consumer to hear our side of the story. How does the individual produce, you know for someone watching at home how do they individually try to change that? Well social media has been a, a big um, thing and you know from Facebook to Twitter to whatever and you know you you have all your followers on Twitter and that kind of thing. And there's um, egg producers now that have been a part of that for a while that have over 40,000 followers. So they're having um, a tweet up tonight that talks about um, with that producer and mom bloggers and you know women that go to the grocery store, they're going to talk about how their food, you know, answer their questions about the food. So there's more activity from the, the side of the producer. Yes, there's been more activity and then like I said fooddialogues.com they have all kinds of information out there that um, you know people ask questions and then people are given the opportunity to answer and then we also have a common ground program mm -hmm. with the um, United Soybean Board and the National Corn Growers and that we're recruiting um, moms that happen to be farm women mm -hmm. to go to grocery stores and other events to talk about you know about their food and you know we buy gr our groceries in the same grocery store as you know Omaha people, Lincoln people, anyone and just they have questions and they deserve the answers. Now to forecast what looks to be a favorable week for planners here's UNL Extension statewide climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks it's time for the weather forecast for this week and of course if we look past this last week the big news was the severe weather outbreak that we seen last Saturday and some of that carried over also into Sunday for Nebraska proper, the best estimate right now is around 12 confirmed tornadoes, and we may actually see those totals increase as more survey damage is done. But the real winners in terms of severe weather was the state of Kansas and Oklahoma, where we've seen well over 140 tornado reports. Now, not all of these were individual tornadoes, well, some of these were multiple warnings as you had tornadoes bumping up and down off of the ground and reforming. But overall, this is a pretty extensive widespread severe weather event. And for Nebraska proper, we've seen some extremely heavy precipitation in short periods of time across portions of eastern Nebraska and southwest Nebraska. And as we got out to the Panhandle, unfortunately, we missed out on a lot of that uh, exceptional weather. And we're starting to see drier conditions materializing. In fact, the drought monitor this week has now uh, upgraded portions of the Panhandle to moderate drought conditions and reduced some of the area in northeast Nebraska from moderate drought conditions. But we have been lucky to get this precipitation. We're going to need to see more. The only thing I could have wished for on this t entire storm event would have been a little bit slower pace in terms of precipitation, so we had less of a runoff component. But overall, 
a very positive trend. We're going to need to see more of this as we go into the future to make up these deficits that have accumulated. So do we have anything in the forecast? Let's take a look at the upper air models and see what we can expect as we go through this next week. And as we go to the upper air models for today, what you're going to notice is the trough that was responsible for the inclement weather that occurred on Thursday as the front, frontal system moved through the state has now formed a pretty significant troughing pattern over the Great Lakes region. And for us proper, we're going to be more in a north-northwesterly flow in the upper atmosphere. So some cooler conditions in northeastern Nebraska, we're probably looking at somewhere in the low to mid-60s. And as we get toward the southwest, as this ridge tries to build in, we'll be looking at highs that will be in the low 70s, possibly even the mid 70s. Now as we go to tomorrow, what we are going to notice is, is that trough deepens toward the eastern seaboard and this ridge starts to encroach into our region. So we're going to be looking at highs moving up the scale a little bit. We'll be looking at mid 60s across the northeast and across southeastern or southwestern Nebraska we'll be looking at the upper 70s. Now as we get into Monday, we see a very significant warming trend in store for the state and good planting weather. We'll be looking at highs in the low 70s across the northeast to the mid 80s across the southwest. We're not expecting anything with in the way of any precipitation and even warmer conditions develop as we get into the Tuesday time frame. We're going to be looking at low 80s across the northeast and as we get to southwestern Nebraska we'll be looking at the upper 80s, possibly even low 90s and for sure on Wednesday we're going to start to see a uh, troughing pattern, try to break this ridge down and that might generate some shower activity across the Dakotas and some of that might clip portions of extreme northern Nebraska. We'll be looking at highs that will drop slight to the mid 70s across the north and into the mid 80s across the south. Now as we go into Thursday, we're still looking for a zonal flow. We'll be looking at highs that will be primarily in the low 80s across the north as the warm air tries to move in once again to the upper 80s across the south. And once again, we'll be looking at the possibility of thunderstorm development, particularly as we get into the Thursday night into Friday. And as we go to Friday, what we're going to see is that the system tries to push this ridge down a little bit farther. Our temperatures are going to decrease to the low 70s north to the low 80s across the south. And an increasing chance of precipitation as we have another trough moving out in association with the zonal flow in our region. So as we look to the 8 to 14 day forecast, and that will take us from the next weekend into the early part of the following week. We're looking at above normal temperatures across the eastern United States. And in terms of precipitation, with that system trying to move out, above normal moisture. Now, there is some discrepancy in where this will occur. And right now, it seems to be tending more toward the north. But overall, it looks to be a positive trend as we get into the next, light next weekend for precipitation. Thanks, Al. If you missed any segments from this or any show, you can log on to our YouTube page or download the new Market Journal mobile app. Next week, Brad Lubin updates us on farm bill discussions, and Rick Brasby discusses cattle supplements going through spring and into summer. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Soybean Board. The Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension, where you can know how, know now. Soybeans are found on dinner tables around the world. Some form of the soybean is found in baby foods, snacks, cooking oils, and many other food items eaten daily. And soybeans provide the protein in the diets for livestock and fish. The Nebraska soybean farmers support research to develop new soy-based products for foods, livestock, and industrial uses through their checkoff dollars. The Nebraska Soybean Checkoff, growing opportunity from the ground up.